Liz Vaughan, welcome back to Ray TV. Not for um, one of your shorter pieces. We've had this planned for months upon months. And uh -huh. a whole host of things have gotten our way, but we finally meet up for a long extended chat um, about the here and now, but also about uh, the long history that you've got uh, yep. with Wraith Rovers. Uh -huh. Great to have your company. I uh, always start these much longer pieces by giving you a wee bit of uh, detail on your club stats. And um, I'm sure like your, your teammates, you want me to forward uh, these on post interview. Uh, of course I. It's some quite interesting stuff. So, um, 179 appearances, 61 goals. That leaves you 89th in the all-time appearance list of everyone who's ever won the Dark Blue mm -hmm. competitive game. And you're sitting 32nd in the all-time scorers list. And if I could give you a little bit of a target. What's the highest? Just, uh, well, you're just 13 goals away from my Mr. Paul Smith. Oh, really? If you need a wee bit, of, uh, need a bit of extra incentive there. He's in 24th. Um, the much uh, larger kind of tables. Mm -hmm. um, again, some of your teammates like to get these, so I'm happy to follow, don't you? Yeah, there's some Aye. amazing stats. We were chatting before we, we got filming the day about um, the uh, the olden days and some quite remarkable stats of, you know, kind of upper 50s uh -huh. in terms of um, one season, Willie McNaught, more than 50 goals in a season, Norman Hayward, who we're going to speak a wee bit about. Unbelievable. Um, more than 50 goals in a season, mm -hmm. uh, 49 competitive. So, um, let's have a wee bit um, start looking at milestones. Uh -huh. um, it's a lot to take in and um, we've known each other for over a decade and um, we could go through game by game and there are real key points that jump out in your career uh -huh. but actually there's much more to uh, lose Vaughan at Wraith Rovers than a certain game for example. Uh -huh. um, first appearance, um, John McGlynn brought you on in the 85th minute and a 3-1 Morton. win against Morton. Uh -huh. um, a lot of faith there from John. Um, never, uh -huh. never one that's shy of bringing on no, of um, young players. Had you been prepped and uh, you ready no, to go? really, no. I had only signed my first um, apprenticeship contract that January. Uh, when it came to the end of the season, a few boys were going to me up and that, saying that I would come on. Blah blah. blah. And he, he read the team and I was on the bench, and I thought that's as far as it would go. To be honest, um, I think it was. 2-3-0 at the time when I came on, I think it was 3-0 and I came on for the last couple of minutes for, I think it was Alan Walker, I think. I um, we went on and played centre mid and um, my mum and my brother were in the stand so then we did a long journey down to Morton to, to watch it because they always thought I might be involved but um, to get my debut at 16 at such a young age was obviously brilliant and um, for the gaffer to put trust in me for 16 year olds obviously meant a lot. Straight from the outset and you came on in the, the midfield. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, is that where you've seen your career is um, developing as a as a, a, a forward looking midfield player, uh -huh. um, as opposed to you know the kind of false nine the, or the more uh, direct striker? Uh, you've also time, played out wide as well. Uh -huh. At that time, probably I was probably more a centre mid, um, probably because I'd played centre mid all through youth level. But then when you get to first level, it's different. Um, so at that time, I was playing for the twenties um, weekend. We kept centre midfield with Ross Callahan, so. Um, Aye, that's probably where I've seen myself playing at, at that time, aye. Great. You, um, that was your kind of debut for Wraith Rovers, um, but your first uh, start was under Grant Murray. Aye. Um, what do you call home, it? Home to Dundee. It's Home to Dundee. Um, I've checked the stats, and uh -huh. Mr Ian Davidson, at that point of Dundee, he was not suspended, he was injured. He was injured. There's a shocker. Mm. What about Kyle Benedictus? Was he not involved? I think we can clear that up in a moment or two. Mm, okay. What do you recall? It was a 0-0 draw? Yeah, it was a 0-0 draw, aye. Um, I'd probably say it's one of my best performances in a rover shirt, to be fair. I got mm. my in the match that day, aye, and I think you would have had to be there to see how well, well I played. Um, I played just off the striker. I think it was Calm Elliott that was up front. I played 10 inch behind Calm, Calm Elliott, and I loved it. I just enjoyed playing, and uh, I managed to get man of the match. I didn't manage to score that game, but I think I'd done a friend but score. Let's talk about the first goal. It was a 6 0 victory against Queen's Park. Yep. Um, August 2013, mm -hmm. League Cup, round one. What yep. do you recall of it? Uh, there was a 20s tournament that weekend uh, up north somewhere, and I was meant to be playing for the 20s. Um, and Grant Murray said that I wasn't going to play for the 20s, I was on the bench for the first team. Um, and the boys were, I think it was 4 0 up at the time that I came on. And I managed to come on, I think I scored the sixth goal, it was late on, I think it was in the 84th or 86th minute, something like that. Um, I, I mind um, getting the ball in the half turn and scoring by a defender and it, 
I could have passed it to Spencer, Greg Spencer at the time, but um, it was 5 0 at the time. I just wanted to put, put it in the net and it hit the crossbar and went in. Another milestone, um, 100th appearance. It was in the Iron Brew Cup round one. We beat Broad Rangers 3 0. And um, for me, it, it stood out. Uh, obviously, 100 games is a real nice uh, landmark, but um, scorers uh, included Ross Callahan, who I know that you had a, a great. Uh, oh really? Poor with yeah. What what? Bro Sc- Rangers was yeah, that? Yeah, scored. Away. Um, it was at Starts Park. Um, Ross scored, you scored, and you also scored the third. I remember it. I remember it now. I scored the second goal. I think. Is that right? That's what I've got here. Ah, uh, the second goal. I think somebody put it in the channel and hit first time volley in the roof of the net. The 50th goal you scored um, came in amongst the hat-trick against the family. We're going to do a little section on on some stats round about the, the, the derby. and mm-hmm. um, So I'm going to ask you to hold off speaking about that specific goal, but what I wanted to pick up there was um, how you've scored key goals in front of the South Stand. Um, mm-hmm. Some ones that kind of jump out for me were um, your goal against Hibs in front of the, the South Stand. Uh-huh. Um, you, your 50th goal you, you, it's a place that um, for some reason you seem to be drawn it'd be interesting to go through all the goals and we'll maybe do this on your behalf after um, uh-huh. the interview just to see what the percentage at each end each end is the percentage is massive I never scored at the way end never the only I'll go as far to say that uh, the goals that I've scored in the, towards the away end at least half of them would have been penalties because I, I never scored in that, that way even if we if the team swap around First half, second half, I always want to sit at the home, home end. I don't know why. Don't know why. I wish I knew why, but yes. <laughs> I wish we could just play two half shooting that way. <laughs> I, I think that a lot of people would be signing up for that. Um, probably an impossible question for you. Yeah, I think you might have a, a, a favourite goal or two, but what would you say is your, your best goal? I'm going to throw a couple at you, in, but I'm going to let you really think first. My best goal is, um, what I think is my yeah. best goal is, um, good question. The ones that stick out for me is the one against Hibs, the 2-1. It was a bit of a scrappy goal, but just because it meant so much to me. Um, the Dunfermline hat tricks were obviously up there. But the one against Dunfermline in the playoffs as well, when, uh, in the second leg of the playoffs just last season, was um, just the way I scored it. The sheer football of that day, or that night? What's that, sorry? Just the sheer football that was on the aye, score that night? Aye, um, My first goal back after my injury when we beat Dunfermline 5-1, um, that goal, um, I've had so many towards that south stand. The Peter Head one um, jumps out as well. The Peter Head one, I. I'm going to give you two different ones though. Um, certainly, the, the the guys at Ray TV were having a wee bit of chat and, and uh-huh. wanted to knock it about a wee bit. What do you remember? A wee bit of irony in this. I'm going to take you um, Dumbarton goal that he scored there. Danny Rogers' uh, his kick it wasn't great. Oh, aye. aye. And um, and there's a lob from aye. 35 yards. Wasn't bad that one. Eh? Goal, that was alright. I remember at the time the wind was quite bad, and I actually said to Mark Stewart, I was like, make sure he kicks it for hand, because he was kicking it for the ground, and he was getting us get him far up, further up the pitch. And just by coincidence, Mark Smith, Mark Stewart's made him kick for hand, and he's he's not got very far, and the wind's kind of dropped it right towards me. I just took a touch and hit it first time, and thankfully it went in. Great. I'm going to give you one more goal, and I wonder if you remember this free kicks. You got a, a, a lovely touch when the, the dead ball's there. I know it's not one at the south say. stand. Well, what do you think I'm going to say? Ross County. Nope. Way more random than that. It was in there way towards the... And I, well, away from home, and I'm going to tell you that um, if it, if anyone was claiming an assist that day, it was Kevin Cuthbert. Ah, uh, Bucky Thistle. I remember that. Cat always, Cat, when Cat um, went to the assistant manager, he always told me I had a good set-piece delivery and a good free kick in me. And until that time, I didn't really believe it myself. So I think Cat was... Especially that season put belief in me that I, had, I was good at set pieces and um, I scored a few free kicks and a good few assists for corners that season. It was that draw to the near post, wasn't it? Aye, it was just so open and cat. I looked at the captain for a hit and he was like, just go for it. So I was like, put my hand up, try to disguise I was going to cross it, but I was never mm. going to cross it. And I scored a few more, like, no, it's probably as good as that, but a few more that I've kind of disguised like I'm going to cross it and whipped it in the front post and I've got a few goals out doing that. So. That's a good one. Um, in terms of landmarks, um, I'm going to ask about the. You went on a, a run of scoring in consecutive games 
that was uh, well, really was up there with the best. Uh -huh. um, you remember how many games it was? Eleven. It was eleven. It was eleven. Yeah. Aye. And I know uh, you lads. Um, you like the stats round about stuff, <laughs> um, so it's not unusual to get a wee message <laughs> good to ones. say, "Could you look this up? Could you find out about uh -huh. this?" Uh, do you know where that stands in in the kind of history of our club since keep in mind we've been a club since 1883 so we've got a few years under the no, belt I'm not sure I couldn't you know, tell there's, you there's only one other player in their history who's beat that not bad isn't it your two games uh, two goal well two games if, if you'd scored in two more you'd agree with Joseph Cowens now keep in mind that he had a record of 13 from the 1931 season so it was two away from you know as we uh -huh. sit here in 2021, something that was 90 years ago. I remember the game that it stopped was at home at Airdrie. Yeah. I remember the f in the first half, shooting towards the away end, and I've, I was put me and Bobby always used to swap sides in that season, and um, this time I found myself on the right, and I kind of cut inside, and I actually hit with my left foot, and it hit the crossbar and came out. This was on the 12th game, and it was weird. I just when it happened, I said to myself like. That's, one. that's it. It's done. I'm not going to. That's the chance I've had. It's, I'm not going to get another chance like that. And um, home Airdrie was the the game that um, knackered it for me. So to score eleven goals in eleven consecutive games is pretty decent, if I say so. Well, something that was um, yeah, kind of ninety years in the making. Nah, it's more than more time, than quite man. decent. Let's um, let's jump right in because people will know an interview with Lewis Vaughan particularly on Wraith TV we, we, you know we're always going to be somewhat biased in our questioning <laughs> so they know we're going to get to this hat trick and I just thought you know what let's kind of take it on but let's look at it for another angle and see where it fits in the kind of wider history of, of our club Wraith Rovers and, and to be fair I'll, I'll make reference to what the stats are for Dunfermline too mm -hmm. um, Wraith Rovers as I say were founded in 1883 so you can do the maths um, we couldn't get a an, an exact figure on how many derbies have been because we've had so many um, uh -huh. pre-season games yeah. and uh, a whole host of five cups and various uh, pennants and trophies and such like. Though I will, I will get that stack. So I've got, um, I've got somebody working on that uh -huh. just now. Um, thanks to Phil Nicholson. Um, how many Wraith Rovers players do you think have scored a derby hat trick, uh, a competitive derby hat trick in our entire history? So I'm counting um, all the standard Scottish competitions: League, League Cup, Scottish Cup. Challenge Cup. I'm hoping not many. Five. Well, there's actually only been three players, but one player's done it twice. Somebody scored a hat trick twice. They yeah, have two different games, but um, brilliant. The player that he overtook when uh, who had been on a to go second, he went on an eight-game scoring run. Was a, a fella called Norman Haywood. Um, he's managed it twice, and. Um, you're going to look. You're, you're probably going to think I'm making this up and go and check it. But the first person to do it in a competitive game for Heathrow was was brilliantly called Albert Pig. <laughs> 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 so Norman Haywood, Albert Pig, and Lewis Vaughan will be forever the written. Will be forever written in and the, the done it, books. That, was it Haywood that's done it twice? Done it twice. He done it. Um, he actually done it twice in the same season. But again, we we'll have to score another one. 1937. That's how far the you've got to go back to find so, that. So that's why when people say, "Oh, you keep going on about this, and you keep, you know, Lewis is such a, a, a career and so many goals and so much um, hope and expectation uh -huh. and the joy that he's brought us," you always come back to that. Well, that's because there's actually only ever been three uh -huh. Wraith Rovers players in our entire history that have managed it. Um, Pretty decent, that. Eh? And for and just to balance the books a wee bit, um, uh -huh. for Dunfermline, there's there's only been three, three as well. Them as well. I mean, on the eve of a, a derby here, I hope I'm not tempting fate. And no, if no. anybody's listening, I hope it's uh, you know, <laughs> Dario Zanat uh, or no. uh, Ethan Varian or so no, forth. On fire recently. So there's, uh, there's where that hat trick fits in. I mean, what's your thoughts when you hear not only the standard question of what did it feel like and tell uh -huh. me about, um, but we actually see that it's got a context and a place within the much wider history of Wraith Rovers? I have. Uh, somebody's done it twice, that means I'm going to score another one, but. I was coaching the 5 1 game, but I didn't know that there was only three players that have scored a hatch against Dunfermline. It's obviously unbelievable to have done it. And to, as you said, to go back to 1937 to find the last person who's done it before me was it's unbelievable. Uh, uh, Wraith TV weren't in existence at that point, but I'm sure that uh -huh. there would have been a, the 1937 version of Chris Duggan must have been involved somewhere. <laughs> somewhere, Because he's, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, more than just a cameo, he's, he's um, uh -huh. contribution to, to that. Oh, his contribution was unbelievable for the penalty, for the cross. Um, for the, the first, the first two goals was um, unbelievable. He doesn't want to forget it. 
Did you um, y just jumping into your your memory quickly? Mm -hmm. it, has there been a more appetising cross that's that's come in than the one that, that Chris put across? Uh, no, that I can remember. Not knowing such a big game, and I remember it when it, when it did cross. I mentioned it coming. I was keeping my eye on it. And it was one of the ones where I was like, it was coming. I was like, oh, I can't miss. I can't. I can't. I can't miss this. But uh, unfortunately, I never. And, um, the goalie was nowhere near it. It was one of them where sometimes strikers have said, y "You have too long too to think much about to think it." About it. Exactly. I, um, but I just had to keep my concentration and keep my my eye on the ball, and thankfully it went in. Thankfully it went in. So let's. Um, I'm going to kind of pick out some spots and just get some general comment round about uh, kind of season by season. But you know, we'll not eke out game by game by game because uh -huh. um, we'll be starving by the end of it. <laughs> so. Um, the first thing that jumped out at me looking back at your, your career and it's things that I've you know, kind of thought in the, the past and is um, there's a real quirk to signing for Wraith Rovers. You're a Hib uh -huh. supporter. Uh -huh. Hib's daft. Your dog's named after one of the famous uh -huh. five. Um, you turned out for Hearts as a youth. Yep. Played there for six years. Yep. And then to confuse things even further, you joined Wraith Rovers from a team called Athletic. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were destined to be with us, weren't you? I know, you? I know. How, what was it like playing for Hearts, given your, your family connection? Uh, well, when I was, when we played for Hearts Youth, we used to play on a Saturday morning. Um, and I had a season, a season ticket for Hibs at the time, so I used to go watch Hearts. I used to go play for Hearts on a Saturday morning and go to East Road on a Saturday afternoon and watch Hibs. Um, so I, at the time, I, I was at Hearts for six years, as you said, and for at least a good number of years, I used to go watch Hibs in the afternoon, so... Um, even though I played for Hearts, I was still a big Hibs fan. Right. Um, Brian Sproul, it was a, um, spotted you, um, brought you across. Mm -hmm. uh, any recollections? Uh, did you know you were being watched? Did you know that there was things in the offing? Was there other um, clubs that were in and around uh, chatting with your family? Ah, uh, there was at the time. So the time that I signed for Leaf Athletic, I left Hearts and signed for Leaf Athletic um, to play with my mates again to go and enjoy football. Um, and we had a very successful team at Leaf Athletic with there were seven trophies up for grabs at under 15s and I think we won six out of seven. And, um, we got beaten in the Scottish Cup final against Dice Boys Club um, and that's when the Scottish Cup final at Boys Club there was quite a few lot of scouts mm -hmm. there and there was quite a few big teams there um, and also Brian's ball at Rafe was one of them um, and I ended up signing for Rafe and there was a few other teams involved but I felt like I had experienced it being at Hearts at a bigger team in Scotland and I was getting to the stage where I was turning 16, 17 and I, I wanted to try and make it. I knew it, it, I had more of a chance to, to do that at Rafe rather than yeah, a bigger club at, at, at one of the biggest clubs in Scotland. So um, that was my decision to, to sign for Rafe and I signed for Rafe at under 15s or 16s I think it was. Is it a family decision? Family happy with the, the sense that they were going to be, you were going to be well looked after? Aye, Brian came and watched me on a number of occasions and I actually got quite close with Brian's brother and I still keep in contact with him to this day um, and he was unbelievable for me. He brought me on a lot. Um, I played for Brian for a year at under 15 or 16, as I mean what it was. And um, unfortunately, he left the club and I went on to the 17s to um, play for um, Cam Robertson's dad, believe it or not. Willie yeah. Robertson was the manager at the time, a guy called Dave Liddell, the under 17s. Um, and I only played a few games there. That's right. I only played two or three games. And I remember one day we were playing at Bathgate and the pour and rain and before the game well, it was like that guy up there with him but I was the first team manager and that's when John McGuinn seen me and um, I played three or four games with the under 17s and I was up at under 20s probably the likes of Ross Callahan, Ross Laidlaw, Colin Wilson, uh, Andrew Walls, players like that and I'm only 16, Jordan McKechnie, um, I'm only 16 at the time and these guys are 19, 20 grown men and I think that's what prepared me for first team football was playing under 20s with these almost grown men at such a young age. It was a really quick uh, <coughs> kind of trajectory through the team. We, we spoke about your debut came in season 2011-12. Uh, mm -hmm. Just kind of preparing and, and, you know, football fans are the kind of sad people that look at these stats and, and, and just it takes us down memory road to uh, uh -huh. memory lane a wee bit as well. Uh, the, the season that you, you know, you get your, your debut and then of course John went away to Hearts. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw some names at you as we go through year by year who, was, who, who the strikers were. Mm -hmm. The debut season with Brian Graham, John Baird, Pat Clark, Damien Casanovo, mm -hmm. Jamie Walker came in and loan and, and uh, Ian Williamson. Right. That's um, an embarrassment of riches in the modern uh, time, never uh -huh. mind um, going back 10 years. I know. What was it like, you say, about you're, you're, you're referencing 
um, peers that are 20 and you're saying, oh, I felt like I was playing in amongst grown men. Uh -huh. um, and and the, these are um, some great players. Exactly. Uh, some huge characters uh -huh. as well as having uh, big physical presences. Ah, uh, even like, I think there was only three or four young boys, at, maybe a bit more than that, five or six young boys at the time under 20 who were full time. So when I did sign full time, training with these guys was unbelievable. I was almost every day in training, I was nervous because I'd, even like the names you just mentioned, it was just like, it was learning how to play properly almost at, at a, a grown level. And I, I wasn't used to it when I first came in, to be fair. They're probably like any young boys, it's like caught in the headlights a wee bit and you almost forget if what you've done for the past 10 years you've played football. And um, as I said, playing with the players at such a young age was obviously helped me for the future. Did you have any sense of doubt? Was there times when you made the journey home and you're thinking either in the car school or you, you get home and you think, what, what am I going to do here? This I, seems the, I, the, the, the jump seems too big. I remember watching Birdie and Brian Graham playing and I was thinking to myself, if this is the level <laughs> I need to get there, I'm toiling a wee bit. Um, but I always knew that I was still so young and I was still hardly developed and I was still obviously really small and hardly filled out. I was still lightweight, but um, I was always still secretly confident that I would, I would be fine. Yeah, you do it. Um, the following season, you know, you get your, your first kind of start there, but you know, only a few games, but there is still Brian Greer. Greg Spence comes in, who's yeah. he's, he's always kind of bounced back, and, and I know it's something that you enjoy playing. What's it like to be uh, to have Greg in and around the changing room and in and around your various drills that you do? Uh, funny. Does he ever stop? Nah, I don't think he does, to be fair. He's, he's a special guy. Um, Funny and good to have her in the change room. Good guy, Spencer. Another one of these characters that seems to be enormously positive. <laughs> I think he finds it good in every situation. Um, I think he scored a few good important goals. I remember scoring my goal against Dunfermline at Starts Park. Um, I think that was this, the season after I'd came in. I think Grant Murray was the manager at the time. and um, I mean, always Spencer talking about it all the time because he was a Dunfermline fan. He used to have his season ticket for Dunfermline and that. So. That's what I remember about Greg Spence. I wasn't quite aware of that. We've, we're going to revisit Mr Greg Spence <laughs> in the next wee while. He's, he's, a, he's done a couple of great interviews with us and we're keen to get him along for some commentary, but it certainly won't be a derby now. <laughs> um, Rovers win the Ramsons Cup uh, the following year and mm -hmm. uh, you play in the early stages uh -huh. um, but you're, and you're in and around the day but not actually part of the match day squad. Uh -huh. Did you know that that was going to be the, the case? How Was it did Paul or did mm -hmm. uh, um, Grant Murray come and chat with you? Well, as you said, I think I played early, a few games in early the rounds. Quarter final, yeah. I played the quarter-final yeah. against Falkirk, Falkirk I think it was, 2-1. Right, yeah. Did Spencer come on and score the winner? I think he did. I think so. I think he came on for me. I think that's how I remember it. Um, I, I, managed, I, I always remember, though, like, you always had, were allowed more subs in the league. And when it came to the cup, I think you were only allowed five subs. So when it came to the final... Um, it was myself, Reece Donaldson and Ross Callaghan who were like, oh, we're only allowed five subs a day, I wonder what's going to happen. And um, Grant Murray and Smudger pulled me before the game. i kind of seen it coming because I think I was 17 at the time. And I was the youngest in the team. Um, and it was probably, I don't know if I should say it, but it was probably, it was probably the easy option, to be fair. Um, and I was, I was just happy to be involved. But um, You're certainly involved in the celebrations. Aye, <laughs> I was, aye. Um, and it was obviously an amazing day for the club and I think nobody had ever seen that coming, that result. So, in the end, they made the right decision and the lads uh, put an unbelievable performance. You had, um, I mean, you had a relatively um, secure run in the team at that year with 27 games and the, the following year um, we finished sixth in the championship because at this point we're expecting, we've been Ruth Rose, are expecting to be a championship club as we, as we yeah. move year on year after year. Um, you mentioned Mark Stewart earlier when we were speaking uh, about the Dumbarton goal and uh -huh. there's another Dumbarton player uh, that you, you played with at Dumbarton is uh, Christian Nadi. Uh -huh. um, what was it like to be in and around um, Christian Nadi's um, energy, enthusiasm uh -huh. and uh, the character that he is? Uh, Christian was brilliant for me. Um, he really was. I, I kind of enjoyed playing with Christian, especially at Wraith uh, and at Dumbarton as you said, but I think it was a kind of big guy, wee guy partnership and um, the same from Mark Stewart, he always used to stay along and stretch the defence which left me plenty of space to go and roam about and almost do what I want and um, I played a lot with the guys in that season like you said and it was really successful, I think I scored seven or eight goals that season so um, towards the end of the season especially I had a 
really successful run in the team. We can move on and we, we move up to maybe kind of um, the more kind of modern history of Wraith Rovers and Ray McKinnon is where I want to kind of pick things up uh-huh. because um, I know from uh, speaking with Ray when he first joined the club you were a player that he had huge plans for. Uh-huh. Um, had he imparted that to yourself as well? I mean for the reasons that we'll come on to it never kind of worked out but mm-hmm. um, was he somebody that had given you a sense that, that he uh-huh. believed in you? He did I as soon as he came in I think he I think it was before the first friendly, he said that I was going to be a mainstay in his team and he was going to build the team around me and he'd seen me last season and he, he thought I ended the season fantastically and he wanted me just to continue off where I'd, I'd left off last season and I feel like I did in pre-season, um, I actually didn't score a goal in pre-season and that season was kind of, I felt for me it was going to be my breakthrough season to go and play every game and score goals and um, I had visualised that that season I was going to play every game and score loads of goals. Um, in the first two games, I, uh, I scored two goals. The first game was away at Kildon Beef, with 1-1-0 and I scored. And I actually got a, a knee in the back um, against Kildon Beef after I'd just scored. And I came off at half-time, I think it was. And it seized up at half-time and I couldn't get back on. So I didn't play. I think Craig Whiting came on for me. And the next game, game was home to Albion Rovers. And I scored the, p- the penalty the first half into the away stand, one of the little goals that I scored in that stand. Um, and then we took centre and that's when I'd done my knee, uh, my first knee ACL. Um, and that was it. Because I'd went off the week before, I kind of knew that it wasn't right and there was something seriously wrong. But at the time I wanted to go back home because I'd came off the week before and I was thinking, this guy's got to come soft. Yes. I didn't even want to go off. So I, I, I convinced Stu, Stuart from the physio at the time to try and let me go back on. And if you remember starts part before the Astro, it was grass, but it had like the wee lip yeah. with a gravel yeah. path. Yeah. So at the time I went to step back up to go back onto the pitches to go back on. Just that lift. Just to be lift and it, my knee kind of gave way. And Stu obviously seen it and he was like, no, nah, off you're coming in. Obviously, for then mm-hmm. on it was confirmed it was my ACL. We, we'll come back to the injuries because it's, you know, it's, it's the elephant in the room, it's a, it's a big part of your story and uh, your journey and, and, and we'll, we'll kind of speak about that as a kind of separate section but, um, you know, just kind of jump in to, to what kind of happens on the pitch and in and around the politics of the pitch. It's the, the following year, I mean, Rovers have a great season under Ray uh-huh. um, and we're playing some really free-flowing yep. football. Uh, Easter Road looms large in the memories of Wraith Rovers fans for so many reasons yeah. in their history but we, we fall at the at the hurdle there as, uh-huh. um, as, as Hibs um, feet is, uh, beat us very fairly mm-hmm. um, but it's the following season that I, I sometimes feel this discussion is like a wee bit of an albatross around your, your back and that is the, the the John Hughes Gary Locke season and it's a season where you you know you're you're playing and, and we're having a wee chat and a wee blether before um, we put the, the camera on and you're surprised that you played so many games. Well, I think there were seven subs appearances, uh-huh. but 21 games, uh, four goals. But we get to um, we get to the kind of Christmas period and, and you're saying, I, I need a longer run in a team. I need uh-huh. games. I need uh-huh. I, I, I need to know that I'm going to be on the team sheet uh-huh. and not a peripheral player. Uh-huh. Um, so I've got some questions round about that, I'm wondering, uh-huh. what, was there any part of that, a wee bit of um, putting down a marker and saying, play me? Aye. Um, obviously, to, I missed a full season after my first knee, so I wanted to get back playing. And I actually played the first few games under, under Gary Lock. I think it was the first seven or eight games I started. Scored a few goals, and I think I actually got a wee thigh strain. And then I came back for the thigh strain out for a, a couple of weeks or so, um, and I just couldn't get back in the team. Um, and I said that I would give it a few weeks and see what happened and I actually gave it longer than a few weeks and it came to Christmas time and I just said look um, so I think it was 17, 18, 19 at the time I, need, I just said I need to play games I missed a full season last season I need to go out and play some football um, being a sub and coming on here and there was, wasn't wasn't good enough I'd missed a lot of football and I went and then said I wanted to go out on loan and um, at the time I wasn't too sure if, if, if he would let me go on loan, if I'm being honest. I, yeah. I, I wasn't sure if he would let me go on loan. I, I wasn't sure if the club would let me go on loan. So I, I basically wanted to see what his reaction was and I said I wanted to go on loan. He was just agreed with me. He said, ah, that's fine, go and play some games. And I was like, all right, that's fine. I'll, I'll go on loan. And um, I mind before a fixture on a Saturday, he said, you're not involved today. Um, you're going to go on loan to Dumbarton. And I was over the moon with that because it was a championship club. And to be fair, at the time, 
uh, rates were flying high, like third, fourth, fifth in the league or something, and Dumbarton were dead last. And at the time, there was there was no raised eyebrows. At the time, I remember reading some comments saying it would be good for me to get some games and stuff. And obviously, what materialised after that, no one would have ever seen coming, especially no myself. But um, aye, the rest is history. What happened after that? Can I surprise you with some stats around about that? You know, it's, it's I don't want this to be a kind of stats heavy piece, but no. I, I like to look at where there's there's sometimes some kind of football and myths around. Mm -hmm. And when you actually go and look at the the numbers and you look at the league tables, you kind of question them. Uh -huh. um, so it's a kind of um, end of year transfer window that you move in. It's your, your first um, your first start, I think, in the, the bench maybe for a game, but it's a, a game uh, at Morton. Would it surprise you to know that at that point um, there were four points between Dumbarton and Wraith Rovers? I made my debut for Dumbarton. Yep, there were four points. Um, the Rovers had a game in hand um, in the Morton game. And and then I think when you start a game, it's four points and there's Rovers have got two games in hand. The big thing that jumped out to me is at that point, Rovers were 13 goals better off. Yet at the end of the season, Rovers finished seven goals behind Dumbarton. Obviously, we were tied on 39 points. So does that surprise you how tight things actually were? <laughs> I never actually knew so that. So when the deal's so, going through, uh -huh, there is actually things are, are a bit closer than memory uh -huh. tells us. I never knew that at all. No, it's just surprised me that wee bit. Um, and I remember making my debut for Morton away to, away to Morton I for Dumbarton. Um, I think the game we finished no no. I generally can't remember, but I I never knew it was such a a small gap at that time. I thought I would have thought there was at least a lot more points than that, but. Yeah. I've had many players um, say to myself, and I've heard them and um, saying to other people who, who do similar roles that we're football players, but we also need to know that we're loved. We uh -huh. need to know that we belong. And for me, there's a there's a real um, seesaw in here because um, you're not part of my plans. You can go mm -hmm. on loan, but you've just signed a year's extension. Uh, how, how do we strike that balance? Uh, good question. I'd, I'm not sure. Um at the time I asked to go on loan, I missed that, actually missed that bit, but um, Gary Lockman was signing a new contract before I went out on loan. Um, and I was only 18 at the time, I was just, oh, give me the contract, I was signing it, I just yeah, want to play football. So I just want to play football and if that's here or away from the club, then so be it. I'm, I missed a year, I just want to play football. So I signed the contract, I went out on loan and I, I was more than happy to sign the contract at Rafe, I just wanted to go and play football and if that was going to get me to go out on loan and play football, that's what I'd done. Um, I think there's a there's a kind of remarkable backdrop to the game, and, and it, it strikes me as you say, looking at your age, how um, you know being a bit older and looking on it, I'm always amazed by how much responsibility we put on really really young men and, mm -hmm. and, and obviously young women in the, the women's game, mm -hmm. um, because you're training with Wraith Rovers, you know during the week, you're playing for them Barton. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm sure you'll be aware of this as somebody has, has pointed it out, but you score four league goals. Uh -huh. And every goal secures points for Dumbarton. Uh, so um, your four goals account for six points. Um, draw at uh, Dundee United, draw at Falkirk, beat, beat Morton, and then there's a, a draw at St Mern. Mm -hmm. um, that strikes me as a really heavy weight to carry coming into the changing room. Now, I also you know, know the players that were around about the time, and there's, there's, there's good humour in there, there's good banter. Uh, but what was... Was there a, a downside to that in terms of uh, just the, the turmoil that, that you maybe feel off the pitch and away from the training ground? I definitely, as you said, I was only training with Dumbarton Tuesday, Thursday nights and Monday, Friday was in at race. So um, I remember a few times on a Saturday I would play for Dumbarton where you get a positive result and I'd come in at race on the Monday and it'd almost be doom and gloom because there's stuff on the table and Dumbarton are climbing the table. And yeah. um, it actually got that bad at one stage that. Um, Boys in the team at the race team were actually phoning me and saying you need to stop playing, you need to, you need to fake an injury, you need to do something. And I was just like, I need to do the job, eh? I'm, I'm put on Monte Dunbar, I, what do you want me to do? It's almost at the time, it, I didn't want this to sound bad, but at the time it was like, I'm not good enough to play in your team, so I, I need to go and do my job for Dumbarton. Um, I remember I used to come out to train on Friday, Mondays, and that, and in small side days, there used to be, a, I don't know what to name any names, but there used to be a few players that would try and kick me and that, so I couldn't play on a Saturday. I, it was hard, though, so I was only 17, 18 at the time, maybe, and it was difficult, like, to be put in that situation. I didn't think anybody in the football in the world has probably been put in that situation. And what happened in the end was really getting his own club, and 
I don't think if you could search them up in world football, it's hard to go for that. It'd be difficult to find one. <coughs> I mean, there's a couple of things I would want to address just that I picked up looking at, at, at the story uh-huh. is that um, you, know, you made reference um, in a, a conversation that, that I had listened in on where you, you pointed to the game where uh, you score against Dundee United, mm-hmm. Rovers get beat 5 now at St Mirren and we see that as kind of D-Day for, for Rovers, uh-huh. the, the world fell apart on and off the pitch there but if it makes anything easier, it was only three days earlier that um, Rovers had lost an injury time goal uh-huh. Um, ironically scored by yeah. um, James Keaton so uh-huh. actually it was in our hands as well Aye obviously at that as you said the Dundee United game I think um, Wraith played at 3 o'clock at St Brennan and uh, Dun- Dumbarton were playing Dundee United at Tanner Dice and it was only Albert at half 5 so I didn't actually know there was the end result at Wraith I, I knew at half time that we were, I think we were doing a few goals at half time and um, I obviously scored the equaliser for Dumbarton which I think secured their safety and I was running up the touchline celebrating, but at that time I didn't know that Rafe had been had been beat so heavily. So yeah, I mean, also there was a week to go after that as well. So uh-huh. um, let's kind of move on to um, a, a really um, this kind of football uh, fruitful season in uh, seventeen eighteen. Barry Smith comes in, mm-hmm. and um, we speak about um, the importance of managers needing to let players know that they're cared for and they're nurtured. Uh-huh. Um, what was it like playing uh, under Barry? Uh, amazing to be fair, it was probably my most successful season. Um, him and Kat and, and Robbo and Craig Easton who were helping it was, were unbelievable towards me. And um, um, Barry from the interest put me off, off the left hand side and as I said before at the time me and Bobby Barr used to just switch sides almost and almost free roam about and just when we lost the ball to get back into positions and it kind of suited me putting off to the left. and. Um, I was I was fit that season as well. I had a I had a, a, a full pre season, um, and I I just I just started the season so well. And I meant I actually mean in pre season that Barry Smith had obviously signed Greg Spence and Liam McCann, two strikers that yeah. he's brought on his players. And at this time, I'm thinking, here we go again. I've just had a, finished the season with Dumbarton buzzing. I've came back today for only gone, and he's just went and signed two experienced strikers that are yeah, probably going scorers. to play because they're his signings um, and in my head I was like here we go again and I was almost like if I'm not going to play only league one I'm almost I'm, I'm wanting to play football I've, I've showed last season that I'm more than capable to play in the championship so I came in I can't say they were going to play me wide left and I, I just wanted to show that I could play wide left and I could play in other positions and um, I hit the ground running and, and as you said this uh, first 11 competitive games I scored in every single game and I kind of just kicked on for there and had a successful season. Goal every two games. In that season? Yeah. It's not bad, eh? You're not playing as a centre forward. I know. I, I think I played, the, I played half played a season as centre mid as well. So I played left, I played centre mid, and I think I played deeper in centre mid. Um, towards the end of the season, I think I went back striker. Um, so I'd played everywhere that season and to score a goal every two games, I never knew that, which is probably. And then, um, then being a Wraith Rover story, we, we can't have a, a lovely, beautiful ending. We have to have the final league game of the season. We, uh, um, we we lead the way, we fall away, air come back, we all roll up our sleeves, um, our Ayrshire um, rivals do the same. Aloha um, do us a favour before they um, uh, bite us in the backside and as the, the game rolls on in a game that I think we might not have scored if we were still playing to this moment, um, the chance comes in and the instinct to, is that you, you stick in and it hits a post. Ah, yes. Tell me about it. I remember it so clear there. I can remember it so clear. Just, I came and just put all the men behind the ball and I had a few half chances earlier on in the game but nothing so clear cut. And, uh, it came down to the last minute. I think it was a free kick or I was balling and balling the right back here and it just went forward. And I think it was, I think it was actually Ian Davis and Davo that headed it back across goal and it's kind of bobbled in front of me and I've, I've just stuck out a leg to stab it into the goal and it's actually hit the post, came back in the way, hit the defender, stopped. But because I've kicked the ball, my, my, my body's going, my fo- I'm going forward motion so I can't quite get my eye to get yeah. back in it and the f- defender clears it but to this day I, I should have scored, there's no doubt about it, but see if it was raining that day it would have went in because the post would have slid and it would have hit the post and went in but because it was dry, it was sticky, it's hit the post, came back sat and the defenders managed to clear it and 
you'll be surprised how much I think about that moment to be fair because it's one that sticks with me for the wrong reasons. Is that as hard um, addressing when you're sitting after the game as one where the, there's been a relegation? Aye, probably worse because it was in our own hands and we just needed to win a game of football and I think Alba had not beat us all season. Every game that season we had scored and every game, every home game we had scored that season and that one game we didn't score and Alba managed to get a point for us. It was uh, it was, wasn't a nice place to be in the end of the game and obviously the fans turned out in their numbers and um, uh, it just wasn't to be in the end unfortunately. Yeah. Following season uh, John McGlynn returns um, to Starts Park and things kind of come full circle. Uh-huh. Um, tell me what it's like working with, with John and uh, and always almost like a, a reflex when somebody hits you, you know, uh-huh. with a hammer, I, I go John uh-huh. and you immediately know you must say Paul as well because they are uh-huh. a, a kind of true double act. Yep. Tell me about these, um, these footballing um, people. Well, they've been amazing for me. For um, the gaffer's first spell in charge of the club, he obviously gave me my first professional contract. Um, my debut, um, Smudger gave me my first start with Grant Murray. I scored my first goal under Smudger when he was assistant with Grant Murray. Um, so they two have played a big, massive, a massive part in my career for giving me my, my first professional contract to give me a chance in the game. Um, to obviously come back the second spell and um, almost believing in me as well for the second spell and giving me everything that I've ever needed and I can't speak high enough for the gaffer and, and Paul Smith have given me everything I've ever needed and they've went above and beyond for me many what, times. What is it that what is it that a good manager, a good coach, a good assistant offers that's that's more than football? Uh, I hear this bit about um, the different types of managers uh, that you get and some managers need to have some of the, the kind of hair dryer treatment, some are the arm round the shoulder, uh-huh. some have a bit of a, a mixed bag of skills. What is it that, that John and Paul uh, I think bring? I think they're di- almost so different that they actually work so well together. I think that's one of the main things that I see is they're two completely different people and they rub off well on the players because one of them comes off different and it's almost like bad cup, good cup and they come across very well to players and um, they're definitely a credit to the club. Do, do, the, do the players um, that, that pull on the jersey and train with throwers, are they aware how much... Um, of a connection that John and Paul have to them, how much they value them as people as well as players? I think so, I, um, as you said obviously, man management's a massive part of the game now and um, I think the players know what, how good um, the gaffer and smudger is and how much they they mean to the club and how much an asset they are to the club. That um, I always see the gaffer, almost signs players that are maybe lost their way in the game a wee bit and yeah. they sign for the Rovers and they have a new lease of life because the gaffer gets them playing for him and he knows what gets a player going, what, what they need, what they need here, if they need a ball in their arm and the shoulder, I think that's where what they get it right. I know that um, something you've said to me before, uh, the, the season that we win the league is, is, is a difficult one for you to look at, um, and particularly when we will come to speak about your injuries. But again, a, another one of these kind of football and... Um, you know, the devil is in the detail, you might have heard that phrase. Mm-hmm. And and I know that the league winning Meadows something you say, well, I don't feel like I like I earned it. And and that, it was a line that you said and it, it, it brought a bit of sadness to me and I was thinking uh-huh. yeah, I've played a bit in my head and thought, um the lowest um, part of of the impact of your injury um in that season um is a game that you score in. Uh-huh. And it's a game that if you don't score in we draw. Uh-huh. And if we draw that game we don't win the league. <laughs> Because Aye, two, points, bad way to put it. two points come off the total, and, and it's Falkirk who's sitting in the box seat. And mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, we've spoken in many, many interviews uh, about the level of um, respect we have for Falkirk and how difficult it was for them to experience the outcome they did. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does offer maybe a slightly different kind of perspective on on what went on. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the other thing about that that I was wanting to ask you about is: um, Are you aware? how much you mean to your teammates and to the coaching staff um, because that particular afternoon um, I, I, I kind of hope that I never experienced um, this first hand but um, the amount of um, affection that uh-huh. was uh, expressed for yourself was um, was really touching uh, maybe I'm not aware of it a wee bit <laughs> but it's not always something that something like that happens that you do realise how much um, people do care about you and what you mean to the club and I think it's just because I've been to the club for so long as well 
I've seen so many players and managers come and I'm still at race over so mm. I think that definitely helps I've obviously been there for a long time and part of the furniture almost so I think that definitely helps and um, I, it's maybe at moments that I didn't realise that um, how much I do mean to uh, the players and, the, and the, everybody at the club, but um, also the support that I've received for the whole my whole career at Rafe. Stuff that have happened so far has been unbelievable. Tell me about last season. It was, um, you know, the tagline when we were selling season tickets and we were doing voiceovers was a season like no other, and uh-huh. um, and of course uh, the only thing it was missing was the fans. It uh-huh. was. Um, uh, a season where we mentioned about Ray McKinnon's season and the free flow in football and particularly post January um, when he was a manager mm-hmm. but um, John and Paul managed to pull off something pretty special last year what was what was that experience like because uh, the easy question to say is tell me about the dressing room tell me about the big characters uh, I think we know the, the dressing room we know the big characters uh-huh. um, the, what was the ingredient that was there was it just a colliding of talent and ambition I think it was a bit of effort. I generally don't know, kind of put my finger on one thing that I could say that was the main thing in, in the in the team in the dressing room. I think it was a bit of effort. Um, as you said, the, the achievement last season was unbelievable. I think everybody in the squad played their part. Um, we, I think we started the season so well. Also with the gaffer not being well and Smudger taking over, I think we started the season so well. And credit to Smudger and the gaffer came back. Um, and especially after Christmas, I think we kicked on again after January. And, um, as I said, the whole squad played their part and it was an unbelievable season and we punched above our weight for a lot of games that season and um, there were so many special moments in the season it wasn't just one game. I think there was loads of games that were unbelievable in the football that they played to go along with the results was just, it was class at times and at times when I was playing in, in the games I was just like, wow, I can't believe we've, we've just created this goal or at times it was almost like I couldn't really leave it myself yeah. um, and obviously the, the players that we had were special players and and also some of them moved on, so um, uh, it was just a, a, a great a great dressing room to be in at the time. And at the time, as you said, with COVID and stuff, it was something that no one was used to. And play, playing in front of no fans, obviously, was something I had to get used to as well. And, you know, if the fans were there, then we could have maybe went one better, but um, we just fell up short in the end. Well, um, can you grab any moments from your, your, your memory that, that immediately... You know, when somebody's going to say about that season in 10, 15, 20 years' time, uh-huh. what are the moments that will jump into your, your, you know, your mind? For me, um, for me it was the Dunfermline games, the, the, the home game against Dunfermline, um, the home game against Dundee, um, and the away game, the, the last game away to Dundee, even though we, we lost in the playoffs to Dundee, and the last game against Dundee, the second game, the second leg, when we won one nil, I think that just that was just a team doing it a tee and how we went out and won that game, I think Dens hadn't been beat off, uh, they hadn't been beat at Dens all season and although we fell up short it was still a statement to say that the team are class basically. Are you aware that um I think it was a if I'm right, it was a pre season interview this year, uh, with John McGlynn and um we know this guy's travelled the world. Mm-hmm. Um, watching yep. football there's barely a stadium in the Champions <laughs> League that he's not visited and prepared detailed reports uh-huh. and, and you guys have sat through his, um, his analysis for many hours so you know yep. the forensic detail he goes through yep. but are you aware that he said if he could only live one game of football again from his entire football and uh, life that's the game he that's would, the game he would he live, would live. <sighs> do you know what I probably wouldn't be far away from that myself if I had to pick one game as well even People would probably say the hat trick, but for me personally, obviously the hat trick was better. But just the, the feeling of that game, it was just as the gaffer probably said before, it was unbelievable just to be involved in the game, and it was just everything just went right, everything just clicked, and I didn't think we'll get a more impressive performance for a long time. It, it was unbelievable. It was just as I said, everything just clicked, and everything was done to a T, and it was just an unbelievable day. It's really interesting for me to see, hear how your thoughts kind of soften a wee bit because um, I've got three extra memories from that from that evening. Um, one was thinking, what what do we do with the highlights when we've got uh, Reagan Henry roaring <laughs> that we keep going uh-huh. and uh, that that um, three, four, five is not enough. Uh-huh. Um, it sounds like it's not at the forefront of your mind, but the first thing that you said after the game was, I should have had a hat trick. Uh-huh. 
they have scored two, a five-one victory, um, and I think it. I, I think, of course, the Derby win special, but. Mm-hmm. If it had been any team, we'd won five one that day. It was the football was exceptional, uh, and young Dylan Tate um, kind of coming up for his post match and and being absolutely raging with himself that he didn't score. Wait, what was effectively the, I think the last touch of the ball. Uh-huh. Uh, I, the, I so five one in a derby win, and um, you and you've got three players that are absolutely pivotal to it, mm-hmm. um, saying we, we could have done more. Uh, Meanwhile, the manager is saying that was dream football. I think that testament to the players saying that. We've won five one, produced our best performance this season and still want more. So I think that speaks of volumes for the players. Let's talk about um the three letters. Um ACL. Mm-hmm. When we chat, we're a wee blether and, <coughs> and we're not going to go through every every one bit by bit and blow by blow. Mm-hmm. Um so I'm interested more in the kind of concept of recovery and this mm-hmm. um this journey you've been on. Um, uh-huh. What have you learned about yourself? A lot, to be fair. Um, I, I, sometimes I just almost lost for words because you can't write yeah. this stuff up. You can't. Even, it's never been seen before, so it's hard to it's hard to say what I think can because it just happened. It happened so fast. I feel like coming back for the first one and whatever, and the last one, it's just it's almost like sometimes when I think about it too much, it's a blur and I forget like what I've done. And people say to me like, "Oh." You know the rehab, you know the steps bit by bit. I'm like, I do, but I didn't think about it because it's like, no, it's became second nature, but just like because I'm, I've just happened so often that I know that I can come back for it basically. Where, um, so the question that I know would be really, really difficult to answer neatly is mm-hmm. where you get your inner strength. But the the one characteristic that that stands out when I think about yourself beyond the football and stuff is um, seeing you coming in as a young lad. Mm-hmm. I have never seen you lose your temper. I've um, <laughs> I've never seen you um, look on the downside of any given situation. But mm-hmm. you're a human being who's Aye. faced um, huge adversity. Um, how do you how do you manage the rage that must be there? Is it there? What's the Aye, it's definitely strategy? there. And it's, I'm just it's just like when people say to me like. Oh, what you got to do after this one? Like, what do you want me to do? Like, I'm not going to sit in the corner and just accept what's happened. I'm, I, I need to get on with it. I'm not going to accept what's happened and sit there and and dwell on it. It's what, what what's happened's happened. And um, well, I did my rehab in a year's time, and if I didn't do it, then in a year's time I could be back playing. If I'm sitting about and I, I refuse to do the rehab, I didn't want to come back. Then in a year's time, the time's going to pass anyway. So if I didn't do it now, then and people always say to me like, how do you get through it and that? But when that when it, when that happens to you, you didn't have a choice. Like, what what do you want me to do? Just do nothing about it. So that's just the way I look at it. You clearly know somebody who's going to sit still. You're always <laughs> constantly moving <laughs> that, that perpetual motion. But that's what, my dad's fault. I can't keep still. <laughs> <laughs> what um, again from the outside of the looking into the players' world? What supports there for you? Is there professional bodies that come in and support players who are who are going through significant rehab? What, what does that look like from the inside? Um, I there is there is I obviously the PFA have a lot to do with it. Um, and the PFA are quite good to be fair, but the club have also been amazing with me, the gaffer, and obviously the boys in the in the, in the team and uh, for the directors of the club. Everybody have obviously went above and beyond for me for a number of years now. I can't thank them enough. Um, but <laughs> I'm probably the person that likes to keep things private and keep it yeah. to myself. But obviously the support at home and my well, my dad and my girlfriend as well. So. There's a lot of good people around me. It's specifically something that I wasn't going to probe with a question because mm-hmm. it, it is private, but yeah. um, I think it is something that the supporters are aware of, the kind of uh-huh. unconditional level of support um, and faith that your, your family and, uh-huh. and, and close network have gotten you. I definitely, as I said, every, the, there's loads of people that have went above and beyond from me, as I said, and um, there's no many people, well, there's lo- obviously my family, that they're going to be from me, there from me regardless, but... For the club and the fans and the boys, there's no many people that, no many clubs, sorry, that can say they've stuck by a player who's done four ACLs. So it's a testament to the club and the gaff and the directors that have done so much for me these past few years, and um, I can't thank them enough. You, you're currently, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're waiting on the swelling down, waiting mm-hmm. on late October. I think it's been through the 25th of October, the, the surgery, so 
Um, it's just about doing rehab just now and um, my swelling's all gone now, I've got full range of motion back so it's just um, waiting to get the, the surgery done on the 25th of October. Does the surgery um, and the, the kind of repeating of the surgery and, and your injured knee at the moment, does that come with risks? What's the, what's the weighing up in terms of longer um, running issues? I wish I knew, to be fair. The surgeons are the surgeon that I'm seeing now, Mr Keatons, is a guy at Murrayfield, uh, Murrayfield Spire. Um, I think he's close friends with Karen who works at the club, so he's been brought with me as well. But surgeons are surgeons and they say it how it is, they didn't beat yeah. around the bush, especially this guy. Yeah. He's, he tells me straight to the point, which is good. Uh, yeah. I would rather he was honest with me than um, fed me a, a pack of lies. So um, he basically says to me that he can get my, my knee fixed and back 100%. And, um, I can get back playing and once he's fixed my knee the rest is up to me so um, it definitely puts confidence in me that he says I can I can get back playing if I want to um, so I, there's no reason why it keeps happening there's no reason why what I can do to stop it happening it's basically just doing the rehab get my legs as strong as possible and that's what I found so hard this time was to get my head around how it happened again because this time I I'd done a lot of rehab with Cameron Ross, um, who's left the club now, but he'd done a lot from me. I'd done everything that I could possibly do. I kept my legs strong, I'd never cut any corners, I'd done the rehab down at a T. And I said that to the consultant, I said, that's the hardest part, knowing that I've done everything. I've done my leg weights, my legs are as strong as, as, as I've ever been. I'm squatting hundreds of kilos in the gym, and yet again, when I'm going to change direction, it, it crumbles again. But I said to the consultant, that's the hardest part that I find is I've done if any, it's just like there's, there's no explanation, there's no reason why it, why it happens, it's just one of the things almost. And we don't know what the, the future's going to kind of hold for any of us, but I mean, you are aware that the, the word that I, I keep reading in the press and I keep hearing people speak about Lewis Vaughan and Wraith Rovers is you're a talisman, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's interesting to go and look up the dictionary what that means, uh -huh. but I think what it also carries though is that it carries a, you carry a respect that's more than just um, a goal scorer and a number 10, uh -huh. um, and you've got a a set of fans that are also really, I'd say concerned, but mm -hmm. motivated and excited by um, what's best for Lewis Vaughan. So the message uh -huh. from the surgeon is that we, we go again and, and, and obviously it would be step by step Aye. because people are concerned about um, about you in 10, 15, 20 years time as well. Exactly and that's what I spoke to the surgeon about as well and you know in 10, 15 years I might have problems but I worry about that then. For me now it's about getting my knee fixed and taking it step by step and taking each day as it comes in the recovery and then goes to get back on that pitch and get back playing and hopefully it's only a matter of time. We recently had, um, I, I don't know, it did mean a lot to you, an applause mm -hmm. on 10 minutes. Hi, hi. Um, I was at the game obviously and it was, it was brilliant to see. Um, um, it, was, uh, it was a touching moment, it was good. There's also um, a, a legend of the footballing game um, holding up your jersey. Hi. <laughs> a nice moment. Hi, brilliant, hi. Um, I didn't expect it at first and I remember at the time Tony Dingle at the time was injured at the time and he was like oh we need to go on the stand let's go the game's going to start I'm like alright mate you're not bored with the game any other, other week <laughs> never mind now so what, what's the rush um, so we managed to go on the stand and uh, when Benny ran out of the strip it was uh, it was um, it meant a lot to me obviously that the boys had had done it for me especially Benny for, for doing it for me so didn't hang about um, taking your penalty responsibilities though did he? no he's, 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 he's took them off me now so you can enjoy them until I'm back and then... Great. Tell me about, um, my final question is, um, if you can rewrite the, you can write the ending to this story, mm. how does it finish? Uh, I get back playing, um, injuries from Bahamian and I get to the top level still. And that top level is Wraith Rovers in the Premier League. Ah, uh, hopefully I <laughs> remember where you are, Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> have you got to, have you got a message for, for anyone really, whether it be the fans, whether it be the people who've supported you, whether it be your family, anything that you'd like to kind of put out there publicly? Um, because um, faith, love, affection, admiration uh -huh. is there in bucket loads, but uh -huh. you know, what, what do you want to put out? Just for everybody for sticking by me, it's obviously been a tough few years, but I've showed that after one, two and three I can come back again, so... Um, the fourth one doesn't change for me. It's only a, I see there's only a matter of time till I come back. The time's going to pass anyway, so I'm going to do it. And I can take it back on the pitch. And I just thank for the fans and the boys in the club for sticking by me and supporting me. Brilliant. Thanks, Les. No worries.